I first met Mark when I was a journalist. I was a foreign correspondent for the Financial Times in Paris, and from time to time I'd write for Blueprint, the British design magazine. So if there was a designer who I thought was particularly interesting, I'd suggest to the editor that I wrote a piece about them. I'd seen some images of Mark's work. It was the limited edition aluminium pieces. I think um, maybe the Event Horizon table and um, the chair that goes with it, and they looked really extraordinary. So um, I arranged to go and see him at his then very scummy studio in Paris. On and off, done work with him for about, I don't know, for about 15 years, yeah. Starting with uh, an exhibition in Sydney for Mambo, the surfwear label. Um, we got some, some of Mark's furniture and illustrated it. And he showed me all those drawings 20 years ago almost, and then we start making like a samples or just casually, very casually. And then after that in Tokyo, an exhibition, um, one, I think his first exhibition in Tokyo, helping with the installation of that, the design of installation and catalogues and things like that. He was very sort of early in, you know, on the game, you know, like 15, 16, 17 years ago when he started. Um, he came out with a particular style which was incredibly strong. But a real test is whether they've got the diversity to apply their style to the same quality and in the same distinctive way across lots of different products, materials and media. And it was apparent even when Mark was very young, right at the start of his career, that he could do that. I remember looking at it for the first time thinking, you know, wow, this is, you know, it's like something from another planet. Mark is a good, good example to be a real design star. And his character is like that too. And I saw the work from Mark Nielsen. I saw the plane, I saw other objects, and I thought, I want to meet this guy. I've been approached uh, two or three years ago to do an exhibition for the Cartier Foundation in Paris, which is a, I've had an, a, a show there once before in 1995, but it's a very uh, prestigious kind of art gallery foundation, and it's privately owned. I suspect that had Fondation Cartier gone to him and said, we're going to give you a humongous budget to sort of, you know, ransack your imagination and just create an enormous piece of sculpture, Mark probably wouldn't have been very interested. But I did have this kind of crazy idea that I wasn't sure whether they'd, whether they'd go for, and I'd, I'd always wanted to build my own aeroplane. Well, one of the endearing things about Mark is he is still a boy. He sort of lives in this boyhood imagination. I mean, his inspirations throughout his career have actually remained fairly constant. I mean, he talks as enthusiastically and energetically about Ken Adams' early James Bond film sets, um, or the Kubrick sets for 2001, or the cars he particularly loves, like Aston Martins, um, the Lamborghini Miura, as he did when I first met him over a decade ago. Um, and I proposed this idea to them about over a year ago now, and to my surprise, the, the head guy there really loved the idea. Newson is obsessed by the aeronautical industry, by NASA, by flight in general, but at the same time also he takes inspiration and information from uh, the aeronautical industry for how he uses and applies materials. And he was working, I remember, on the airplane. This was in his head the most. This was real, uh, the biggest thing he would make. I think all his creations is from uh, his young days, or, uh, young boyhood. You know, so he draw those, he loves all those jet planes or uh, cars. Or... The notion of creating this dream jet, this fantasy jet, which has doubtless sort of unleashed lots of ideas from which many of his everyday mainstream products 
will derive. That was very, very appealing to him. I approached a whole bunch of people in the beginning. I had several meetings with MIG, actually, in, in Russia to, to build this thing. And they were, they were really excited about doing it. But we got prices in from them, and they were just kind of horrendously expensive. In fact, two, I had meetings with two companies in Russia. One was MIG, and another one was um, a company called uh, um, Misashev. And they were the factory that built the Russian space shuttle. He was so concentrated in working for the Cartier Foundation on, on the Kelvin, that I thought, okay, I need my time. And I wanted he finished first his Kelvin, because it should be great to have a real plane in the show, in your museum. So anyway, they went, they, they went for the idea. They liked the idea. And then it was up to me to try and understand how feasible it was in terms of getting it built and, and getting it produced. It was before the, yeah it, yeah, it was before the 11th of September. Therefore, we didn't have any uh, yeah, further load <laughs> in what it means to get in an airplane in your building. The flight in the MiG came about because I just, you know, I simply wanted to, to be able to, to go in a MiG. I thought, you know, it would be really a very interesting experience. You know, I heard that it was possible. And uh, I asked my friend if she could organize it, and she said, of course. And she did. You know, it was more as a kind of a, not really a joke, but I mean, it was, it was a little bit of a kind of a dare for myself to, and, uh, Surprisingly enough, she, you know, the day after I was in Moscow, uh, we were sort of chauffeured off to this uh, to this airport, and there was a plane ready and waiting. Oh, it was exciting! It was fun. I mean, it was you know quite heavy. I mean, it was like full acrobatic, you know, um, full acrobatic maneuvers. And, you know, I think we did, we pulled about seven Gs at one point, which was kind of pretty intense. In retrospect, yes, it was fantastic. I mean, at the time, it was kind of, um, you know, the actual experience of flying in a MiG. I mean, you, you know, you wouldn't really. I can't say, I can't say the actual experience itself is good. I mean, it's kind of quite painful at times. But, um, you know, the idea of having done it is certainly fantastic. And the experience. I mean, you know, the kind of physical sensation. Some of the physical sensations are pretty, are pretty extraordinary. Most of them are quite kind of ugly, but, uh, but it was interesting. I'd do it again, though. I mean, be a little more prepared. I mean, the, the thing about flying in a plane, you know, it, there's nothing about flying at a supersonic speed. It's simply the amount of Gs that you kind of pull in, a, in that kind of, um, you know, in that kind of aircraft. I mean, it's such an extreme kind of experience. Well, the feeling of being in the MIG or the idea of going in the MIG is, is very kind of linked for me to the idea of, of, of being in Russia, you know, the idea of actually being able to go in a plane like that. Um, and the fact that it could only really happen in a place like Russia. You know, Japan culturally really, really interests me and so does Russia in a way, or so does Moscow. Um, 
you know, it's a kind of fascinating place, but it's it's uh, it's fascinating because it's a little bit like it's a little bit like the Wild West. I mean, anything's kind of possible, you know, with a with a minimum of of kind of effort and knowing a few of the right people, you can manage to get a flight in the MiG. You know, I could make contacts with you know the president of the Russian Space Agency. Incredible. Thank you very much. You did very well. That was unbelievable. And the important thing, which is to be recorded, I want to confirm that he oh, did everything by himself. Oh, All our betting, excluding the... And there's just absolutely no way that you can go to the U.S. and, um, you know, kind of stumble into the, you know, the, 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 the president of, of, of NASA's office. I mean, it just kind of won't happen. You know, you'll never be able to fly in an F-16 or an F-18. It just, it just kind of won't happen. Um, and you know, being in Russia, it's uh, it's interesting. It just kind of demystifies the whole, the whole, the whole thing, really, because it becomes so accessible. Yeah, I kind of became obsessed for for a while there with the idea of going into space. You know, I, I understood that um, the Russians were, were were going to let people go into space that were willing to pay for it. This was before it actually happened. And I had a couple of good friends in Russia, one, one in particular actually with, with quite good sort of government connections. Um, and through her I was able to sort of go to various launches uh, in, in Kazakhstan, launches for the International Space Station. I went to actually three launches in Kazakhstan. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, well quite a bit of time in Moscow and made some contacts in the Russian Space Agency. Um, but it became clear that, that uh, the kind of money required to actually pay to go into space was slightly beyond what I could afford. Um, the first guy that actually did that, Dennis Tito, I think it cost him like 15 million bucks or something. So I had my name sort of taken off the list at that point. Materials and technology are, are pretty much what it's all about. Process, materials, technology, things like that. I mean, that's what ultimately interests me about what I do. You know, I don't design things to uh, to collect it, to collect pieces of design. You know, I'm not I'm not designing things to acquire them. I'm designing things ultimately to sort of learn about the way things work and to learn about um, you know how things are made, how things are put together. You know, how to kind of improve things, how to engineer things. You know, so, the, so all, all I get at the end of it is the knowledge, which of course is a lot. So, you know, process, technology, you know, that's all about acquiring knowledge. Working with Nicholas and, you know, everybody else in the studio, there's, there's sort of massive computing power being used to do three-dimensional modeling of ideas sort of as they come out of Mark's sketchbook. He sits on airplanes for half of his life and spends a lot of time sketching in sketchbooks on airplanes, comes back to the studio and the stuff goes into the computer and you know, it doesn't really matter all that much for him, I think, where, where the studio is. So I think the kind of mixture of our background but with a technical kind of facility, you know, I think I've always naturally been technically, uh, you know, capable, um, has kind of helped really, I suppose. He has a real zest for playing with different materials, different technologies, different processes, using them in very unexpected ways. And that's generally a very important, for me it's a very important part of, of what I do is, is um, you know, is the process. Because you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's all about the process. It's all about what you've learned during the, during the process. You know, I don't get to, you know, I don't, I'm not building this thing because I want to have it. I'm building it because I want to do it. He pushes himself to reinvent not only the way that he approaches different materials and processes, but the way that other designers have done as well. And that is a real underlying strength to his work. The 
what I will have got from it at the end of the day is, is the knowledge that we've, you know, we had fun doing it. And, you know, we, we could do it again. But with Mark, what underlines his work is an absolute love of this and a real discipline when it comes to considering the kind of materials, the kind of processes, the kind of technologies he's going to use. You know, I really enjoy when we're starting out on a project and he seems to conjure a particular form out of something, out of the air, as it were, to, as a response to a particular brief that we have. I, I think for Mark, a lot of it is, is about the beauty of the form, but it's, that is really the byproduct of what the technologies and the materials can offer him. These things are really about how to build that shape and what material to use. You know, how, how do you take a piece of metal and, and form it like a piece of uh, plasticine? There was really no brief from, from Ford at that time in, in terms of what they wanted. They, it was just a, like a lot of the commissions that I have, well not a lot, but some of the commissions that I have, people, uh, people are as much interested in my idea of, of the brief itself as the design that I end up doing. O21C was immensely enjoyable um, as a kind of a big achievement, I think, for us. I mean, it was a fairly scary the day that Ford actually said, OK, go, make a concept car. He was very much learning as he went along because one of the reasons, I think, why it's such an important project for him is that it really was a huge challenge. It was a, it was a big learning curve, but, you, you, you know, oddly enough, just because a car or a plane, it's not, it's not too big of a learning curve. You know, it's, it's the process of design. Whatever, whichever way you cut it. He'd never designed a car before, and the whole notion of car design and whole styling, the idea that to create a straight line, you don't actually create a straight line, you create the optical illusion of a straight line, was something that he'd never worked with on that scale before. So Jay Mays of Ford, head of design at Ford, was very, very helpful to him in talking him through that process. I mean, I'd never done anything, had anything to do with making a car before, and not, I'd never, I'd worked for pretty reasonably sized, reasonable sized companies before, but never one quite at the scale of Ford. Whether it's a watch, whether it's, you know, I mean, the car was, was, was a collection of things like that, it was a collection of small bits. In terms of complexity, it's, it's no more difficult than a watch. It's just a lot more work. You know, it's like 500 watches. I think, for me, I certainly like things that you can really get your teeth stuck into that might take a year or something like that. So that doesn't really scare us. Um, you know, something that's usually might appear to be insane and hugely complicated and why bother uh, is actually kind of a challenge that I think we both seem to like. Um, the car was like that, working in Turin, was very, um, at times, uh, very trying for both the Italians and us, I think, for different reasons. <laughs> um, but. Uh, you know, it all worked out in the end and everybody was happy, but uh, th that was something that was a very intense experience. Well, I went to see Mark in Turin when he was building the O21C and he'd sort of bunkered himself away in gear, the carrozzeria that Ford owned there, for about 10 months and it was pretty miserable because Whenever you look at sort of amazing examples of industrial design, they always look glossy and glamorous as though they sort of, you know, just been sort of spawn in someone's wonderful imagination. When you actually hear the designers talking about the reality of developing them, it's always a nightmare. But 
maybe the O2-1C was actually to show the industry what, you know, that they need to maybe look outside their own design studios for inspiration. And um, from that, you know, came this amazingly sort of naive, yes, in a way, but this fantastically, radically rethought um, you know, concept car. You know, the idea of a car, if you ask a little kid to design a car, it would kind of look like that. Where I was able to really make a difference, I think, is with the details. And I think that that's a problem that exists in, uh, in automotive design, that the, uh, the detailing on most cars, on all cars, is, is I find quite horrendous. Like the Kelvin 40 in a way, uh, it, it expresses many of Mark's um, you know, design approaches, not just in, in the, the literal transfer of details such as the steering wheel looking like the Alessi hook or the dashboard implements looking like the iPod watches, but there was, a, there was a, say, a lateral approach to the thinking, not just redesigning an existing typology, but stripping it back to the basics and starting to think what actually is needed in the perfect vehicle. It was pretty interesting in terms of the car because, you know, there were many opportunities to, you know, to um, to draw upon um, expertise that was available from other companies that I worked for, such as B&B with the upholstery, such as iPod with all the instruments, Alessi for other bits and pieces, uh, you know, Prada for the, for the luggage. So it's one of those projects where you can see his mind bubbling away and all these ideas evolving as he went along. But again, there are references to Mark's work throughout his career. You can see the organ shape that he loves, the carpet's very similar to the carpet in the plane, the dials on the dashboard look very much like his Icopod watches. Um, things like the sort of suicide doors, the revolving seats, go straight back to his sort of dander, Ken Adam design fantasy fantasies of his boyhood. So there are these familiar strands from Mark's work, but at the same time, the O21C was something that really forced him to rethink his approach to design, learn a new sensibility, learn new techniques. I think that's why it's such a vibrant project. So it was a daunting prospect, but it, you know, at the end of the, you know, all you can do is get up in the morning and show up and do what you do and hope that that, you know, gets it, gets you through. Well, the idea behind the car was to design a car. Um, I was asked by Ford to design a car, and and that's my car. <laughs> that's what I did. That's the result. And the first part of the process really was to, well, the first part of the process was for me to design it, which I'd done quite, you know, almost two years ago now. I'd, I'd come up with the sketches and come up with the, the early designs on, on paper. And, and as is normally the case with anything I do, it's, it's then a question of um, getting that into kind of virtual space, you know, building it on a, on a computer. So it was 317 to the centre. It doesn't include the threads, so it's probably a good... It's, it's probably more like 35. It scans of pages out of Mark's sketchbook, which is quite a common way that will work. He will have an initial idea. And the sketches for him don't represent they're really only uh, like a mental, a, a notation of what he's got in his head. The piece will be visualised in his mind and then he'll draw it in a sketch only simply to capture that. So it's just like a notation. It's not meant to visually necessarily represent exactly what it is. It's just like a, a form of writing down a note, that something that he can remember. 
Um, so, you know, often it starts quite simply like that and he wouldn't bother to take a sketch much further than that. So this is one I, where I've scanned and then I put that in the CAD program and all we do is simply trace around it and that then becomes the starting point for, you know, working up the sections and so forth. And then from there you just keep going and then keep going and keep going. And uh, as the guy from MIG told me, he says, you know, look, aerodynamically, don't worry too much. I mean, they saw this design and we had several meetings with them. And they were, you know, he said the design's no problem. He, he suggested several modifications, which we made, just in terms of giving it kind of a bit more lateral kind of, you know, stability in terms, you know, the airfoils at the back and things. Um, but basically, at the end of the day, he said, look, we, you know, we can put a, we can put a, gen, a jet engine on a door and make it fly. Pretty much my right hand in, in the studio is a guy called uh, Nick Register. And we thought, well, we just, you know, let's just do it ourselves. A, it'll be way, way cheaper because there was a limited budget. I mean, it's probably one of the most expensive things they've ever had to kind of fork out for. Because, it, as I said, it's not a commercial thing. It's not like they're going to turn around and sell it, you know. It, And these are some basic, uh, you know, these are these are drawings of the renderings, I should say, of of the 3D model, which which exists at, at one to one scale, sort of on the computer, virtually. Um, it looks pretty simple, but in fact, it's a it's a pretty complex it's a pretty complex 3D model. That, that's the kind of level of detail. I mean, that, that, that's the sort of preliminary. I mean, these I've just sort of hand drawn lots of sketches on this, but that you know that shows the sort of interior structure of the thing, which unfortunately no one will ever see because it's hidden inside this this sort of aluminum aluminum and carbon fiber skin. That's the basic, that actually exists right now. That, that has already been built, that part of the structure. You know, all of these pieces are sort of tongue and groove, so each one sort of, it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. It's quite small. In fact, it's very small by, by aeroplane standards, it's probably about uh, as big as a, as a Piper Cherokee or something like that. I mean, in terms of wingspan and length. It's designed for kind of pleasure. It's designed for someone that it holds two people. You can just kind of get in this thing, kind of like, you know, go somewhere for the weekend or, or do whatever you wanted to do. But, you know, very fast and it would have a pressurized cabin, so. I mean, there's quite a bit of space in the cockpit. There's quite a kind of roomy cockpit, so you could get quite a lot of stuff in there. You know, you get enough for two people, a couple of big suitcases. But it's really, it's, it's, it's what I call a, a concept jet. You know, people design concept cars. I mean, I've designed concept cars.
Yeah, the Falcon private jet was really the first time I'd had any serious exposure to the aviation industry. You know, apart from, you know, going to loads of air shows and, you know, simply being interested in aeroplanes. Um, but that was the first actual aircraft that I, that I worked on. And it was a great way to start too, because I was really given carte blanche to sort of do whatever I wanted, you know, within the sort of guidelines. Obviously, budget's never an issue with with something like that. Frankly, it doesn't matter if you want, you know, 100% silk carpet or polyester carpet, it'll still cost you, the, you know, a few thousand dollars a square metre. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was really a lot of fun, a purely decadent kind of project. It seemed to make perfect sense to me that someone like Mark, who spends more time flying in airlines than almost anyone else I know, should design for a big airline like Qantas. I travel probably you know, at least 100 days a year, I'm in planes, at least. You know, one year I counted 200. He spent hours and hours and hours wriggling around in an uncomfortable manner, failing to sleep on airline seats, so he put lots of research into it. As a designer, I feel uniquely qualified to kind of contribute something. When you consider that most people that design airplane seats probably be lucky to spend, you know, eight hours a year in a plane, it's, um, it's no wonder that they're generally pretty uncomfortable. Just, it's frustrating. It's, it's, you know, all kind of good design ultimately leads from some sort of frustration or some kind of anger that, that, that what, what's out there is just crap and, you know, could be so much better and why isn't it? So. The level of regulation and bureaucracy that comes into play when you design a product that is so health and safety and engineering intensive as an airline seat is very extreme. You, know, you couldn't choose to work in a more, uh, in a more closed or more restricted or more kind of highly governed um, area. There are so many regulations or kind of regulatory issues that you have to, you may as well be really working in the military. So he managed to persuade an enormous, very bureaucratic organization like Qantas that it was in its interest to invest much more effort and energy in the design and development of that seat than it traditionally would have done. And Qantas seems to have reaped commercial benefits as a result. I mean, and it looks better as well. I mean, there's, there's got to be, there's a lot to be said for something that actually looks good on an aeroplane because there ain't a lot of that at the moment. You know, I still make a lot of what, you know, what I refer to as unique pieces. They're more like art pieces, sculptural pieces. They're, you know, they generally sell for lots and lots and uh, lots of money. It's only very recently though, in the last five years, that those things have become worth significant amounts of money. You know, I mean, 10 years ago, you could have bought one of those, bought a Lockheed Lounge for, you know, not very, you know, a few thousand dollars. I mean, now the last one it sold for, I think, 350 US or something. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy, you know. They're, they're leading a life of their own, <laughs> which is great.
Well, one of the things that gave me confidence in Mark as a designer was that I loved his work. I mean, at the time when I first met him, he was right at the beginning of his career, but he'd done a couple of pieces that were really sensational. Um, he'd already produced a number of limited edition pieces, so he was working with Body Works, an Aston Martin subcontractor in Newport Pagnell, at the time sort of very cheaply and re pretty scarcely, because he couldn't afford to use them very much. And he produced these incredible fluid sculptural forms as chaise longue and chairs and they really were quite extraordinary shapes they clearly came from a very rich vivid imagination you know having complete and utter kind of artistic control doing the you know I'm my own client with the unique pieces you know I'm not having to kind of um, deal with the wishes or the desires or functions functional sort of necessities of, 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 a, of a third party but it's me, you know, I, I really just do whatever I want. You could see his training as a jewellery designer in that whereas jewellers work in a very, very meticulous, very pure way on very tiny, tiny objects, Mark had actually had the discipline and the vision to apply that level of intricacy and skill across a much broader canvas. It's a different way of working, you know, in both ways are kind of equally valid, you know, having restrictions or having, you know, a lot of people refer to as compromises is not a bad thing. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's what design is all about, you know, it, it defines the parameters of, of, you know, what's possible and what's not possible. And that in turn drives to a large degree what the thing ends up looking like. Well, Mark actually arrived here about 10 years or so ago with one of our Aston Martin customers because Mark liked Aston Martin. Furniture first came in, I thought it was great. I really did, yeah. I love the shapes. The first ones we done properly, Richie, he done the um, organ chairs, yeah, and then it went on to the event and rising tables and all various ones, yeah. But no, they're all lovely. Some of them we don't like, the latest ones we don't like because um, they're horrible to make. But the, the ones that are hollow, the hollow furniture is superb. Yeah? Well, I think the first pieces we made were the event horizon tables, and then organ chairs, organ lounges, and it's sort of all built up from there and we're still making them. I think most of the additions are started to be finished. Um, and there are new additions in the pipeline. Well, yeah, that's it, it's clean, clean work. If you look at the lads doing the chassis, it's filthy work, yeah. And I mean, this is dirty enough, but doing normal casting is terrible, yeah. But at least on the furniture, you get a better shot, you yeah? know. Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a pure chance meter, really, just stemming from his interest in cars. And these objects are, for me, really technical exercises. In, in fact, it's the way that I, it, it's, the where, it's where I started my career. The first thing that you saw when you came in, the, the Lockheed Lounge, which is the silver kind of lounge, I made the first one of those myself in 1986 because, in fact, I trained as a jeweler, not, not as a designer. Um, but this is the way that I learn about materials and, and I understand materials and I learn about processes and, and these, these kinds of projects, although that, you know, they don't have any inherent kind of commercial function, um, they, they, you know, they, they teach me a lot about all of these processes and, and that inevitably ends up influencing uh, all of my other work. The project right now is pretty much on track in terms of timing. I think that 
that we shouldn't have too many delays really obviously there's always an, a lot of unexpected things that that happen but you know we've been working on the project for well I've been working on it for almost it will be two years by the time it's finished so you know there's been a lot of preparation and a lot of sort of organization first came here he was looking to buy an accident and he only stumbled on this place by mistake really he was shown here by an Aston dealer to look at an Aston Martin for sale and when he came here he was walking around and I was showing him around and he said um could this be polished a front end it was DV6 yeah or something it could be and that's how it all started really because before that he was doing the Lockheed lounger have you seen the Lockheed just little squares cut out, like, um, like play school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's how it all started, isn't it? And it's done as much room as it has for us, really. For them, really, it doesn't, you know, to be honest with you, the work, the work that they're doing is, 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 is panel work. You know, so, you know, it could be a toilet bowl for all their care. It's just, it's just a big bit of metal work. Metal's metal, you know, car body. Aluminium furniture didn't make any odds to us. There's always problems, there's always sort of hitches, but you know, it was the same when I did the car for Ford, when you do sort of an ambitious project like that. Well really, the only problem we've got is the depth of these flanges. All this has to be stretched from flat, yeah? And the back's in what we call a return, an inside-out curve, which is quite difficult as well, yeah? But they're only the, the same shapes that you get on a car, yeah? Just bigger. The size factor don't hit you until you're actually into the job. When we start to assemble the framework in this small workshop, I mean, eight meters on paper is a lot smaller than eight meters in reality. You know? Now he knows what can be done. He pushes the boundaries all the time. Hence this. I thought he was totally mad. You know, to be honest, yeah, totally bonkers. But it's just it's just juggling, you know, uh, fifty things sort of simultaneously. You know, worrying about you know how you're going to countersink the rivets properly. You know how you're going to get all the panels to meet up. How you're going to guarantee continuity between all the, all the panels. How are you going to attach the plexiglass to the canopy? How do you know the landing gear is going to hold you know 1.2 tons off the ground? How do you know you know what, what pressure do you do you have to put in the tires? I mean, I mean, you know, it's, it's just. Each one of those things is not rocket science. It's simply the amount of things that, that you need to figure out at one time. 60% or 70% of the time is spent just logistically organizing the entire thing or managing the process or dealing with clients or dealing with suppliers. Well, it's not, it's not even, we're not even drawing on, on the resources of the entire studio. I mean, really, it's Nick and myself that are concentrating on this project, and that's, that's the way I want it. It's been what we call a fun project. I mean, it hasn't, to be really honest, it hasn't always been fun, simply because a project of this scale becomes also, a lot of the time is spent just organising it logistically.
frankly speaking. You know, we work very, 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 um, you know, well together and, you know, we're both kind of on the same wavelength. We share the same kind of level of commitment, you know, we're both pretty obsessive in terms of, you know, wanting to get the thing done. It was a bit of a shock to us all, you know, just how involved the job was. And of course, we were asked at the time to put some sort of rough estimate in and you just sort of pluck a figure out of the air and hope you're somewhere near. Very few of my clients actually end up going to the trouble of prototyping something if they're not going to make it. You know, those prototype, the, the, the phone prototypes, for example, you know, cost an enormous amount to make. I mean, there's a significant kind of investment that, you know, both in terms of, of money and, 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 but also time has gone into kind of the whole thinking behind that project. You know, I think generally people have, you know, want to give the product the best possible chance to make it into production and the best way to do that is with a very accurate and, and, and uh, faithful prototype which is what KDDI did. And KDDI were, you know, they were actually really nice clients to work with. They, uh, it was interesting. We often go through a thing where a, a, I think it comes from larger design houses or the expectations of clients are that you're going to generate a multiple, that you're going to generate a bunch of concepts. So if they come to an industrial design house, they're expecting to see, you know, at the at least three different concepts or responses to a brief. Uh, Mark, for better or worse, doesn't work like that. His, he tends to have a vision of what he wants to do in response to the... Because he's, he's not a design studio, he's an individual that has his particular personal response to a brief. Obviously taking into account what the clients are looking for, but it tends to be one. And you, know, you get an account, a, a contract department drawing up saying, OK, well, we're we're entering into a contract with this design studio, we better get three concepts. It's the classic thing of getting three quotes so you can make a choice. And so they always want three concepts. And so we're always fighting to, in the contract to try and either reduce that to one or keep control of it in such a way that it doesn't just become a contract, you know, like where are our three concepts? You've only done one kind of thing. We put all our effort into the, the single response, if, if you like. And in the case of this particular job, we went through that kind of, you know, three concept thing. And we ended up doing two concepts for them. And they came to visit us. And so we said, OK, 
you know, and, and often Mark's feeling is that you know, if you do more than one concept, they're going to pick the one you don't like. <laughs> It's a very basic response, but you know, it's a true and real, real response. Anyway, so we presented the two concepts to them. They were very happy, very, you know, very charming people. And um, we said, okay, you know, what concept do you want us to go? You know, they said, let's keep going. And so we said, what concept do you want to work with? And they said, oh, you choose. So <laughs> it was kind of fantastic. So we kind of went, oh, hell, we could have just done one all along. <laughs> nobody here because this is the press day so there's no public obviously um, but, but yeah, it was pretty much what I expected I think I mean uh, it's, you know full of full of you know cheesy stands and dancing girls and stuff I mean it's, it's kind of hilarious actually The best thing about this place is all of the girls. The girls thousands. Are well, and they're all pretty cute too. I guess they get chosen for their looks to a certain degree. I think uh, 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 Mike's design is now is a concept model, but we should realize this concept model for the uh, usual telephone. Okay. I'd written a piece of music inspired by Talby called Free, and I went to Moscow to work with the Moscow Symphony Orchestra and uh, recorded a five-minute piece um, and. 15 seconds of that piece is now being used. Uh, it's pre-installed on 300,000 phones, so when the person gets it out the, pat the box, the first phone call that they receive, they hear the Moscow Symphony Orchestra, which I reckon is a first for a mobile phone. We picked quite a lot of movie references, particularly Kubrick, because he used classical music really, really effectively. And plus the, uh, the user, if, if they're somewhat familiar with Mark Newson, they'll know that some of these um, movies have been a big inspiration in his work. This is free. So this is what it will sound like when someone calls me. The uh, level of detail on er on in, in everything to do with Talby, whether it's the sound or the GUI or, of course, Mark's design, everything tells a very uh, strong story inside and out. I can say that as a professional designer with, with a lot of uh, experience in the industry of industrial design, that that's a very, very rare uh, thing, that the translation or the evolution from prototype or concept through to reality, uh, I, I've never really seen it uh, evolve in such a coherent way. Bucky was a large sculptural installation and I was asked to, to design, you know, I was given this fantastic space and asked to design an installation. Well, given that I wasn't really an artist, you know, I didn't want to do the sort of pretentious thing and, and, and pretend that I was an artist and come up with a sculpture. So I decided to, you know, come up with something that crossed the boundary between installation, furniture, design and, and sculpture.
basically what it was was a collection of chairs that could be built into a into a sphere or, or a dome. You know, so it was a bunch of basically bits of sculptural furniture that could be built into this installation. You know, so it kind of covered all of those bases. You know, very simple, very kind of clean, very coherent concept. <laughs> I think really the hardest thing about doing the G-Star project for me was, was simply coming to grips with the idea that I'm not a fashion designer and I don't want to be a fashion designer, but this is clearly in the realm of fashion. First time we met, uh, yeah, he was motivated to do it and personally it clicked. And we didn't know each other personally. I didn't know him, he didn't know me. And what was nice that he's uh, uh, easy to work with, easy to cooperate with. You know, I do have a a style, I guess, like, like most people do. And there are things that I like and that I like to buy. And actually, a lot of the time I can't buy the things that, that, that I'd like to wear. So I thought this might be an interesting opportunity to, to, you know, to address those issues. Our main designer, Pierre Morissette, have a lot of ideas about uh, not only clothing, about chairs and about cars and about form and shape. And that's why we talk, should maybe Mark has ideas about clothing and he never did clothing. So this was uh, uh, something uh, interesting to, to see how we think about this. And this was uh, actually the idea, let's call him, let's see if there is a cooperation possible. The technical aspects really of, 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 of what I did uh, are more interesting in a way than the garments themselves, I think. You know, I approached it from a product designer's point of view. You know, fashion is, uh, it's kind of all about assembly, you know, it's all about how things are put together and things are generally put together in, a f in fairly traditional ways. You don't really find that many fashion designers or, or people in that industry thinking outside of the box and thinking about new ways of, uh, of attaching things or new materials. And I think they felt, as well as me, that there was some scope to approach, you know, garments from a different perspective. I'm 25 years in this business and sometimes we think so deep and complicated and how to make things and how... Uh, and he looked in a very naive way to the garments, in a very naive way how to make it. He don't like seams, he don't like... Uh, 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 workmanship, he like as simple as possible, and this was uh, this is I think the most interesting that it's uh, very simple and it's very mark. There's nothing that radically different about what you know about the results, but there are details there that I think. You know, when you look closely, you, you'll perhaps pick up that they're not, you know, executed in the same way that, that a fashion designer might. As you can see, we tried to do as less stitching as possible. So uh, it's almost like it's glued together, the whole product. So it's glued together, it has rubberized details and no stitchings. What makes it a whole new product and a very simple product, as you can, as you look at it, it's a very simple product. Then color-wise, it's only white, black, grey, and raw denim. Raw denim is of course G-Star, so that's the mix between Mark Newson and G-Star. You know, on one hand, they're very different to what G-Star normally produce. On the other hand, they're, you know, I think they're very accessible garments you know I'd certainly go out and buy them and everyone I know that's seen them would actually go out and buy them which is which is a great thing the, 
the lever house ended up after uh, it became a, a fairly long project. I think it went for about three, over three years in the end. But September 11th was in the middle of it, and well, not long after the start, actually. So that kind of um, held things up for a while. But it, it's ended up incredibly well. In fact, probably in terms of all the interiors I've done, it's definitely the most resolved and, and the, the best, the best finished simply because of the money that they spent on it. And the fact that we could get the best contractors because there wasn't an enormous amount of work happening in New York at that time. Um, you know, we really had the sort of, uh, the, the choice of the best people. And it was all union organized as most jobs like that are in New York. So, you know, you pretty much guaranteed a reasonable result. It's really the same as where the ideas come from from any of my projects and it's ultimately just you know sort of somewhere in the depths of my imagination. There's never any particular event or, uh, or, or set of circumstances that, that, that contribute. Um, it's just it's, it's always the result of um, you know thinking about a project and, and, and kind of considering it and, and just trying to come up with ideas. Coast itself was the most ambitious interior project I'd done until, you know, up until that time. But, you know, obviously, the further you progress in your career, the more and more ambitious projects become, or well, they have so far. Um, but that was 1995, so, you know, we're talking almost, you know, 10 years ago. So things have moved along a hell of a lot since then. I mean, Coast was great because it was the first big job that I had in London, you know, and it was at a, a sort of um, an economic point that was fairly buoyant. Today's not a good day to ask me intelligent questions about Kelvin because if you want, this is the really true stuff, you know, I'm just, my brain is like custard okay. and I can't think anymore and I've been up till three o'clock in the morning for the last four nights in a row. Well, uh, I feel pretty good that the plane's over, but unfortunately it's not completely over because we still have a lot of um, kind of retouching and things to do, on the wings especially, which, uh, you know, we had a lot of problems with the carbon fibre. It looks exactly the way we've designed it, so the way Mark designed it and then the way we kind of uh, engineered it, so it looks identical to the way we expected. Basically today was, uh, we were waiting for the wings to arrive. The plane has been actually here, the fuselage of the plane has been here for several days and um, we've just been waiting for the wings to, to, to install, to put the wings on. I was also working a little bit on the interior. Um, we had some kind of last minute adjustments to make. Most designers don't, don't find it that important, I think, to be actually involved in the construction process. But for me, it's actually the most important part of the whole, of the whole uh, evolution of a of an object because you know it's the way that you learn about uh, how things are made and how things are put together and you know for me it's not really just a question of designing something it's a question of learning you know how things are built
I had a fair idea, uh, but you know, I didn't think it would be quite the amount of work that it was for everybody. This is probably the most ambitious project that I've done in terms of a, um, you know, a sort of single-handed project. Unlike most of the other clients that I have and projects that I have, you know, this is a project that I did really by myself and also um, with an enormous amount of help from my team, in particular um, Nicholas Register, who we worked really basically together on this project for the last year. But, but the most difficult thing, I guess, is just the, you know, basically choreographing the construction of such an object. You know, just two people choreographing the construction. I mean, normally you have, you know, dozens of dozens of people working on such a such an object. But we were really two, kind of trying to organise everything. It's not a total surprise for me today to see it. It's just very nice to see it all together, and the fact that it's not falling over, and you know that it's holding itself structurally well. It actually embodies a lot of the symbols, the reference points, the light motifs that have run through Mark's work throughout his career, whether it's certain shapes, whether it's the sensibility that he acquired in his years as a jewellery student, that sort of attention to detail, the love of the intricate, the sort of pure and the refined. I mean, you can see all those things in Calvin, which is this humongous eight metre square object, which at the same time taps completely into Mark's boyhood imagination, all his dreams of sort of futuristic flying machines, rockets, space travel, engines, somehow they all fuse into this weird and wonderful object. I mean, it is, I guess, uh, the, the young boy's dream come true, but it is, for me, um, more beautiful than mere flight requires. It's, it is somewhere between a piece of beautiful jewellery and the future vision of flight. Well, firstly, there were two types of tests that we carried out. One was a wind tunnel test, like a souffleur, you know, a typical normal wind tunnel test, which is really an indication of, of, of how the thing, of how the, of how the, the object can behave aerodynamically. Um, it's a little bit old-fashioned in a way, but, you know, most of these things now can be done digitally, which is what we were doing on the other side, where um, similar kinds of tests, more sophisticated tests, were carried out di digitally. So... Um, uh, you know, you can calculate the, the speed of, of the aircraft, the angle of attack, and you know the incidence. I mean, all kinds of different factors you can you can you can put into the uh, plug into the analysis. Um, but the point is that normally speaking, getting access to this kind of technology, getting access to a wind tunnel, getting access to the computers that run that kind of software, it's it's pretty difficult. You know, they're very very sophisticated sophisticated things and you know typically you know universities or, or research institutes have, have access to that kind of stuff so that that was first you know a very interesting point for me the second thing is that um, the digital simulations for example that you can see on, on on that screen people in the industry had never really considered that they're beautiful I mean you know, they, that's what they do you know I look at them and, and a lot of people I know look at them and they're like amazed, you know, they find the images like they're, they're so kind of unbelievably beautiful. Um, but they're actually really doing something, it's not made to be beautiful, they just look beautiful. So I thought it would be really nice to illustrate, uh, you know, some tests which are actually completely valid and, and had to be done, but to, but to show, you know, what they actually look like and, and the way that you describe um, visually certain phenomena that, that, that occurs when you, when you test test the aircraft. The, the wind tunnel test is, is kind of a strange one because it's, um, 
sometimes can look a little bit hokey, you know, can look a little bit amateurish, but, <laughs> but that's the way they used to do it, you know, I mean, that's actually what, what they do, you know, there's a guy standing with a stick with smoke, like with incense, and, um, you know, he holds it in the front of the plane and they blow air. It's the, it's the funniest thing, you know. And it's, you know, compared to digital tests, more sophisticated tests, it's, it's not so easy to understand, um, you know, the, the kind of feedback that you're getting exactly. But nevertheless, it's, it's still considered quite important and, and I find it very, very, very beautiful, which is the reason that I wanted to show it. For me it was always important to test the plane or to test a model of the plane because otherwise you, know, you just don't really know what it's going to do. So yes, it was really um, about kind of validating the whole, the whole process that, you know, that we just didn't do this whole project for nothing. You know, it actually could fly and fly pretty well, no fundamental problems with, with the aerodynamics. Um, and, and actually, as I said before, what I originally wanted to show in this room was the tools and the way that the plane was made. But in the end, I found this stuff much more beautiful and, and, and far more kind of relevant in a way. You know, for me, th you know, this was the sort of research and that was the result over there. So I kind of changed my mind close to the, close to the, the opening of the exhibition. And, you know, it's very difficult to understand if people understand any of this or if they even care or you know what, what they what they think of it but it's you know from a kind of an intellectual point of view I found it really interesting have a, like a year off from from the real projects and do something totally at the moment at least uncommercial but uh, I think it's really fantastic to do something on that scale I'd seen some photos and, and drawings from Mark and uh, so I, I knew what what it was going to be, yeah. but uh, it doesn't prepare you for the reality. But It's, it's, it's definitely the biggest exhibition that I've ever had of, of any kind, really, the most ambitious. Luckily, this, this show will tour, so, you know, as it moves to different places around the world, it will, it will probably get slightly bigger and uh, maybe be curated in slightly different ways.
Retrospective is even a, you know, I find a slightly bizarre kind of term. You know, it's sort of, it suggests that it's, it's something that you do at the end of your career. And, you know, I feel like this is, I'm sort of smack bang in the middle of it right now. There are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, followers. Mark gave them the encouragement and then the uh, influence. He opened up the gate, in a sense, you know, to those younger, new way of design. His strongest projects are the ones that challenge and engage him. So if he continues to get those challenges as a designer, I think he will do really extraordinary things. What I would love is if those extraordinary things cost less money so they were affordable and accessible to many more people. But that's what Mark wants as well, and that's certainly the direction that his career is going in. He will be remembered when we are died, when we are not alive anymore, and when everything may be old-fashioned, but not what Mark Newson has done. That's very important to see it now already, when he's still how old he is. 35? I don't know. 40 years old. Oh, my love. <laughs> And Mark is one of the handful of designers. I mean, Jasper Morrison would be one, Renan and Erwan Burelek would be others, who I've met and I felt absolutely confident, even on the first meeting, no hesitation, that he was a really important designer with something very interesting to say, that had a genuinely distinctive approach to design and whose work was going to be remembered in 20, 30, 50 years' time. Kelvin, for example, is, is an ideal project for me. But, you know, you really don't make money doing stuff like that. You know, it's a kind of labour of love. It, it pays off in other ways in terms of press and, and sort of publicity. Also, it has an enormous benefit in terms of, you know, the amount of skill that you acquire, the amount of knowledge that you acquire. You know, I'm, I'm a much smarter person now than I was when I started that project.